This morning, I would like to share with you for the first time a message I actually completed last night. And it's called Israel, God's Nation for a Reason and for a... Before you throw tomatoes at me, you're going to probably be shocked this morning to know that as a Jew... As an Israeli, as someone who was born in Jerusalem from the tribe of Judah, I will tell you today that Israel has an expiration date, but it's not what you think. Okay? All right, so you have to listen all the way to the end before you already start tweeting that I'm a heretic (laughs) and heresy is going on here. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And we ask you to sanctify us today by your truth. We really don't want to listen to man's wisdom this morning. We want to hear from you. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So... Let's uh, dive into this message. So, first of all, there's a lot of misunderstanding concerning Israel, as you'll know. People have a hard time with this nation. Let's face it. For 2,000 years, they were gone from their land, and everybody felt pretty good with it because, hey, now Christianity is all by itself. No competition anymore. Then comes the state of Israel and changes everything, and... And people started wondering, do I need to now become a Jew or what, you know? And uh, it's very interesting because within Christianity, there are two common claims regarding Israel that both are scripturally incorrect. The first one is that Israel has been replaced by the church. They truly say that 2,000 years ago when the church was born... That was the end of God's affair with Israel. That's it. The church has replaced Israel. But the other claim is not less incorrect. And that is that Israel will remain a separated nation unto God for eternity. And so we have to understand that these both are not based on on the heart of God and the word of God are based on things that were taken out of context from the word of God. Now, you know, when God created the world, he did not create Adam as a Jew. All right, Adam was not circumcised. And, and uh, the Sabbath was not celebrated in, in the Garden of Eden. And... The choosing of Israel began later, of course. We know that it was Genesis 12, the first three, chap- the three verses, is when we start dealing with Israel. But Israel did not exist early in Genesis, and you have to understand that. The history of our world did not begin with Israel. It has to be very clearly um, communicated. It wasn't until after the flood and the Tower of Babel that God called out a nation for himself. You know, God created a perfect world. A world that was not meant to be destroyed originally. He saw things and he said, it's very good. Adam had dominion over all that God created. Man named all the animals. They all submitted to him. He could call the lion and tell him to sit down and he would. Snakes would not even, you know, bite or or, or poison us, you know, in the original plan that God had. But in order for God to be truly worshipped and truly loved, he gave man free will. Or else he would never be truly worshipped and truly loved. There is no love without free will. That is number. You do not want your children to be programmed 
to say that they love you. You want them to, to want to say that they love you. And that's what God is all about. So free will came and we know sin entered. And we all know that for the first few chapters of our Bible, sin is already in motion and everything is deteriorating very, very fast. Israel only entered the scene via Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob after sin already entered the world. But it was, Israel was not chosen from the onset of the creation. We have to remember that. And, and, and obviously the worst part of the Bible is Genesis 6 verses 5 and 6. These are the most, the saddest verses in the entire Bible. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. And now comes the saddest part of the whole Bible. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. He was sorry. It started with one sin about just one fruit, one tree. And it ended all the way in every thought. Only evil continually. In the Tower of Babel, what happened there? You would think that it was an innocent thing. He just gathered together, built a tower. What's the big deal? They do that in Dubai. Well, they actually exposed themselves by saying, let us what? Build a tower. And then they said, let us make a name for ourselves. The whole aspect was God should be out of the picture. Man wants to take dominion and make name for themselves. There's one thing that God is always worried about is his name. Remember that. And now suddenly man wants to make a name for himself. That's why 1 John says that all that is in the world is what? The lust of the eyes and the pride of? Yeah, but the Greek word alazonea is actually the pride of the assets. <laughs> we boast in our name written in places and in what we acquire and buy with whatever we make. Make name for ourselves. You think it's only then? It's even now. It's a culture. We are adopting the wrong role models all around us. Dysfunctional families on reality TV becomes the role model for everyone. So here we are, a world that is deteriorating so fast, so fast from chapter one to chapter six, and we're done already. And then God decided that he wants a flagship nation. Now, a flagship nation means it doesn't necessarily that they are better people. No, that not at all. But it's a nation through whom he will work. And it started with Abraham in Genesis 17. We see then God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. God is telling an old man that he's going to give him a son through his old wife. And then he said, then I will bless her and she will be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and what? Laughed. Like he thought God has a very good sense of humor. And he said in his heart, and I love it. He said in his heart as if God cannot really understand what we say in our hearts. He said in his heart, he dare not say that out loud. He said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is only, who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said, now Abraham is talking to God. First he laughs in his heart. 
And then he says to God, oh, that Ishmael might believe before you. He thought God is senile. And God is probably thinking about Ishmael who was already born. He said, yes, yes, thank you, Lord, yes. Ishmael, yes. And God said, excuse me, I'm not that old. I did not talk about Ishmael. He said, no, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name what? Yitzchak. Laughter. You shall laugh. You laugh? You're going to call your, name, your son that name. <laughs> Thank God he was only laughing. Can you imagine if he sneezed? Or coughed? And said, I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him, he said. And then, of course, came Isaac. And to Isaac, he says in Genesis 25, this is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old. It's getting better. Now it was 100, now it's 40. 40 years old when he took Rebekah as his wife, the daughter of Betuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister of Lavan, the, and, and she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Wow. Then came Jacob, of course. As far as I know, first time twins are mentioned in the Bible. And then, of course, Jacob in Genesis 32, and he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed over the fort of Jacob, of Yavok, and took them, sent them over to, uh, to the brook, and sent over what he had breaking, uh, what he had, uh, what he had, excuse me, and Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail, against him he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him and he said let me go for the day breaks but he said I will not let you go unless you bless me so he said to him what is your name and he said Jacob and he said your name shall no longer be called Jacob but what Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray, tell me your name. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. Wow, what an encounter. A man is receiving a name of a whole nation. And when God raised up Moses hundreds of years after Jacob went to Egypt, he made it very clear that he would continue to preserve his covenant. We see in Exodus 6, 2 to 8, And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. I want you to say that. I have remembered my covenant. That's what God said. So I've seen everything. I've remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. 
I will redeem you in an outstretched arm and with great judgment. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. This is why we drink four cups of wine on Passover. For every one of those promises that he said that he will. I don't recommend wine drinking. It's not like I'm not pushing it right now. I'm just saying, if you're wondering why four cups, this is it, okay? Because I know exactly some people will take that excerpt from this message and look at this. And then, of course, look, people freeze my videos like that, and they say I worship Satan because I'm saying this, I'm saying this, I'm saying Crazy. Oh, watch this. And then he said, Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as what? As a heritage. I am the Lord. This is it. All the struggle in the land of Israel right now. Palestinians, Israelis. <laughs> to whom the land belongs? There's only one who judged, one who decides, one who promised, one who gave it as a, as a what? A heritage. A heritage, and he binds it with his name. I am the Lord, he said. Not the UN. United nothing or unnecessary. <laughs> I am the Lord. So why did God choose Israel? I mean, what's the point? Deuteronomy chapter 7, 6 and 8 says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you. The Lord your God has chosen you. You're not choosing yourself. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Again, he chose them to be a special treasure they did not choose themselves. You understand that? Because they knew themselves. <laughs> you know yourself. Are you a special treasure? Only in the name of Jesus you are. Or else you're not. Now watch this. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. For you were the least of all peoples. But because of the love, because the Lord loves you and because he would what? He would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers. The Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God said it. Deal with it. Live with it. Accept it or not accept it. It's your problem. But he said it. See, God's love for Israel does not negate his love for others. It's not like he said, I choose you and I reject all the others. I love you and I hate all the others. You are great. They are eh, eh. No. That is never the case. God chose them in order that he will through them... Communicate his love for all of you. He simply has a special love for his chosen people through whom he would eventually send also his son. And by the way, the Bible is talking about what are the advantages of the Jew? What is, is there any advantage for the Jew? Now, make no mistake. Apart from Christ... There is. In Christ, no more. <laughs> oh, so I don't want in Christ. Oh, if you don't want to be in Christ, you have no forgiveness of sins, no eternal life, nothing. The advantage, Romans 3, 1 to 2 says, what advantages then has the Jew? For what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. I mean, 
Paul to the church in Rome, for Italians that are happy that there is some Italian connection here, to the church in Rome that was, by the way, made of Jews and Gentiles. Paul, and it's a church that Paul never, ever visited when he wrote that epistle. He still doesn't know who, who's there. So he writes pure 16 chapters of, 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 of <laughs> doctrine. And from first chapter on, he mentions Israel, Israel all the time. So, and he says in chapter 3 that the Jews do have an advantage to, because to whom? To them were committed the oracles of God. You can't just dismiss them as if they were nothing. God gave them the oracles, he said. And in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 5, says, I tell the truth in Christ. First time Paul is saying such a thing in such a, an amazing emphasis. Take a look. I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience is bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. Basically, he covered all of his, all of his corners, all of his grounds. He says, look, what I'm about to tell you, A, it's the truth. I am not lying, he says. And what I'm about to tell you, it's not even for me. My conscience is bearing witness in the Holy Spirit. It says the Holy Spirit is telling me that. That I have great sorrow as a Jew, he's saying, and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren and my countrymen according to the flesh. He says, Paul says, if I could save the Jewish people by ways of me being a curse from Christ, I would have done that. But that's not how it works. You don't believe for someone else. You know, it's not working like that. Maybe in some churches it does. That somebody else is praying, somebody else is believing, and that covers you also. No. You need to have a personal relationship. with. So Paul says, I wish it could work that I'm a curse so my nation would believe. And then look what he says. He says, he says, my countrymen according to the flesh who are what? Israelites. And then look, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenant, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom according to the flesh Christ came who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. He said, look what God gave them. Look what God did through them. Look at the promises that he granted them. I can't just dismiss them. Everywhere I go, every church, every nation I'm landing in, whether it's in Asia, Asia Minor, whether it's in Greece, I'm going to go first to the synagogue because they need to know. But then, Jesus came to the world and something Significant happen. Very significant. While there is a great advantage for the Jew, none of it was necessary when man's fellowship with God was unhindered. Ladies and gentlemen, salvation was never by affiliation. Never. You cannot be born a Christian. Wait a minute, it's written on my certificate. No. What should be written on your birth certificate is born as sinner. <laughs> you, no person on planet earth has ever been born a Christian. No one. To be a Christian is to be a follower of Christ. And for that you need to be born again. So you cannot be born a Christian if you need to be born again to become a Christian. You understand? Jesus was not a Christian. Now the tomatoes are being pulled out. <laughs> Jesus, was, Jesus could not be the follower of Christ. He is the Christ. He's not a Christian. He is God in the flesh. At the same time, I'll tell you, God is not Jewish. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, salvation is not by affiliation. You cannot be born. You, salvation cannot be given to you because you were born to a certain family, to a certain religion. It cannot. 
happen. It never happened. It will not happen. In fact, in Luke chapter 3, look what it says. Then he said to the multitudes that came to be baptized by him, Brother, a brood of vipers who warn you to flee from the wrath to come, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the ax is laid on the roots of the tree. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And look what Romans 3 says. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. All. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greek that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is one who understands. Uh, there is none that who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Wow. And remember Jesus in the synagogue of Nazareth. He opened the book of Isaiah. And he was reading, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And everybody, yeah. Isn't that Joseph? Uh, if Jesus, the son of Joseph the convert? Look, good kid. And then the woman to their husband, why is ours not like that? And you know, and Jesus is, is saying, is reading all those messianic amazing prophecies. And then Jesus says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He basically said, I am the Messiah. And you know what the Bible says? What does the Bible say? All were amazed at the authority and the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. He just said, I'm the Messiah. And they're like, wow. Wow, Amazing. Gracious words. And then he looked at them. He knows what they think. And he said, you probably say, physician, heal yourself. Do just like you did in Capernaum. We heard all about the miracles. Do it here. We're your brothers and sisters. This is the village. This is where you were raised. Come on, do something. Let's see you in action. And he said, no. He said, he said, many widows were in Israel in the time of Elijah. But to none of them did Elijah go, but to the widow in Zarephath, Tzalfat, which is in, in the area of Lebanon of today. And many lepers were in, the, in Israel at that time of Elisha, but to none of them Elijah went, but to Naaman the Assyrian. Then when they heard that being Jews is not enough, then when they heard that salvation is not by affiliation. Suddenly all those gracious words that he said before were gone. And now they were filled with wrath. Willing to even throw him off the cliff. From Israel's inception to this day, God's intent has never been for Israel to be replaced. Make no mistake. In Genesis chapter 17 it says... I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. That's, of course, the promise to Sarah about the everlasting covenant, everlasting possession, of course. But in Jeremiah 31, look what it says. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I have made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke. He says, look, they have the Torah, but they broke it because the Bible says that if you break one, you broke everything. It says, I gave them the Torah, obviously they couldn't keep it. No one could keep the Torah. The Torah was never given for anyone to be able to keep it. It's the mirror to show you that you need a savior. Amen. And he says, after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and after those days and write it on their hearts. It's going to be a spiritual thing. Not, it's the Holy Spirit. It's not going to be just, you know, a law that was given. And then, 
Every man, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them says the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Basically, this is a prophecy written by Jeremiah the prophet, the same Jeremiah that saw the consequences of Israel's sins and the destruction of Jerusalem. If you remember, he was there. He wrote Lamentations, the book that you probably read every morning. No? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the same Jeremiah that says there is hope. But it's the same Jeremiah that continued and said, Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation from before me. God said through the prophet Jeremiah, as long as the sun, the moon, and the stars are there, the nation of Israel will stand there as a nation before me. Period. You understand that? I wish I could write a letter to the Ayatollahs in Iran and tell them, don't send rockets to Israel. Send rockets to the moon, the sun, and the stars. Because only when they will no longer be there, then Israel will no longer be standing. Now Romans chapter 11 says in verses 28 and 29 concerning the gospel at the moment. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. Because they are not willing to receive and they're not willing even to proclaim it. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the... Exactly. Remember God said, I choose you because of my oath to your fathers. Concerning that, for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are what? You can't change it. Well, the church replaced Israel. Really? I just read to you the verses that says that it never happened. I just read to you the promises that Israel still has. In Romans chapter 9, we see Israel's past. It's not that the word of God has taken no effect for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your seed shall be called. That is those who are the children of the flesh. These are not that you see. He's basically saying affiliation or salvation is not by your affiliation in the flesh. It doesn't mean that from the moment Jesus came, Israel is no longer Israel. It means that salvation is not by way of how you're born and to what nation you belong. You understand that? Roman chapter 10 is telling you about the present. They have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone to all the earth and their words to the ends of the, wor of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation, the Bible says. And, but Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So you see at the present disobedience. But then Romans 11 make it very clear. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not, he says. For I also am an Israelite. For of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? And then you can move on and on. But what I'm trying to tell you folks is the birth of the church, 
did not replace God's everlasting covenant with the nation of Israel. Paul actually cautioned believers against such teaching. God did not forsake his people. Certainly not, he said. <laughs> he warned the Gentile believers against it. You will say then in Romans 11, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and, and severity of God on those who fell severity, but towards you goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they... Able to, and, and then also, if, and, and if they did not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to the nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? He's not forgotten them. There is a hope for them to be back grafted into their original tree. You understand that? No, I still believe he replaced them. You're entitled to believe whatever you want. It's just not scriptural, that's all. Whether Jew or Gentile, one cannot enter the kingdom of God unless they are what? Born again. When the angel was sent to Egypt to kill the firstborn, he was not given a GPS location of where the Jews are and said, kill the, unborn of all, the, the firstborn of all the rest. In fact, he, he was not even given the task to kill the firstborn of the non-Jews. In fact, he was not even given the task to spare Israel. One thing. When you see the blood pass over that house, that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, in John chapter 3, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night. Why by night? Jesus was not popular, so you will meet him in the daytime. So he comes by night. He's a ruler. He's a leader. He doesn't want to be seen with Jesus in daylight. So he comes by night and he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. He doesn't know that he is God. <laughs> he says, God must be with you. No, God is with you. I am Jesus. I'm Emmanuel. I am with you. God is with you. And he said... Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is what? Born again. I'm saying that to the Italians. I'm saying that to the French. I'm saying that to the uh, Arabs. I'm saying that to the Jews. I'm saying that to Chinese. I'm saying that to all people on planet Earth. Unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. He said, Jesus said that. You cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The first birth is with water. It's a... It's, it's, it's a, it's a uh, in the flesh, but the second one is a spiritual birth. And you, you have to be born of the water and of the spirit. Amen. Not one only. When Jesus entered the scene, the reality of one new man, whether Jew or Gentile, began to materialize. You understand that? It's very important that you know that. Jesus entered the scene... And everything changed. And it changed for, the, for good for all of you. Think about it. Simeon in the temple. Old man is holding baby Jesus. And he's saying, that's Simeon. Lord, 
Now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. The name of Jesus in Hebrew is what? Yeshua. The name of salvation. The word salvation in Hebrew is what? Yeshua. That's why he's called Yeshua. Because he is the salvation. And he says, I have seen. My eyes have seen your salvation. Which you have prepared before the face of all peoples. And look what he says. A light to bring revelation to what? The Gentiles. And the glory of your people Israel. He is not now the Messiah of the Gentiles and forgot about Israel. He is the light to bring revelation to the Gentiles. Gentiles must convert. Why? Gentiles believed in many gods. They needed a converter to one. Jews did not need to convert. They need to repent because they were having belief in one God, but they went astray. And he had to bring them back to the right. You understand that? And he said, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. Revelation, there is one God. They just already know that. They just started believing in the rabbis more than in God himself. In tales and in fables and in other things. The teachings of man rather than the word of God. And when he was baptized, John saw him. John did not say, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of Israel. Look what he says. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away, away, away what? The sin of the world for the first time something happens that re is for the whole world a light of revelation for the gentiles that takes away the sin of the whole world it's amazing to the canaanite woman jesus said that jesus went out from there and departed to the region of tyre and sidon behold the woman of canaan who came from that region cried out to him saying have mercy on me o lord son of david my daughter is severely demon possessed but he answered her not a word and his disciples came and urged him saying send her away for she cries out after us but he answered and said i was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of israel And when she came and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered and said to her, oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. That very hour. And to the Samaritan woman, Jesus said to her, woman, believe in me. She said, look, your father is worshiping Mount, in Temple Mount, our father is in Mount Gerizim, you know. Why are you here? <laughs> What are you doing here? And Jesus says, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the father. Do you understand what just happened? He just declared that the location of the temple is irrelevant from the moment he arrived in the world. And watch this. Wait. No need. He said this. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. Hello? That is the proof that Jesus was born as a Jew. Because they, you know how many people say that Jesus is not, Jesus is the first Palestinian. Jesus is this, Jesus is that, Jesus. Look what he says. And then what well, he says, but the hour is coming and now is, he says. Now, as you look at me, as you talk to me, he said, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Jesus basically said to the Samaritan woman, I came to bring an end to religion. Do you understand? Enough. Why? Because God is spirit and those who worship him, not should, must 
Worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. So we see the promises in the old are being fulfilled in the new. Isaiah said, indeed, he said, it is too small thing that you should be my servant and to raise up a tribe of Jacob and to restore the, the uh, preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth, he said. Hosea says, then I will sow her for myself in the earth and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people. Look at yourself, all of you, you're Gentiles. You are pig-eating Gentiles. Now maybe you are not pig-eating, but you are Gentiles. But you are Gentiles and you were not his people when he was before Jesus came. You understand that? Yeah. And look what he says. I will say to those who were not my people now as Jesus came, when faith in Christ is, when you understand the light of revelation to the Gentiles, when you understand that he came to take the sin of the whole world, he says, you are now my people, he says. And he says, and they shall say, you are my God, God of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ, He is now our God. You say that. And who said that? Hosea. Romans 9.25, as he says also in Hosea. <laughs> Paul is quoting Hosea to the church in Rome, to the Italian spaghetti eating. <laughs> he said to them, I will call them... My people who were not my people and her beloved who was not beloved. In Christ, there is no Jew nor Greek. We are one new man. Wait, why are you? Listen, let's agree you don't clap. It's a waste of time. Listen to this. In Christ, in Christ, there is no Jew nor Greek. But in reality... Today in the world, there is a Jew and there is a Greek. In Christ, there's no male nor female. But in reality, whether you were brainwashed or not, still there is a male and female. <laughs> you understand that that's, but in Christ, that plays no role anymore. In Christ, your status, whether you're male or female, whether you're Greek or Jew, that's it. It's the same. In Christ, one new man, all equal. Yeah, but I really want to be a Jew. Why? Well, you're Jewish and Jewish people are more... No, no. We, we, listen to me. Listen to me. I don't understand why people want to be Jews. First of all, we don't want you to be Jews. But second, what's the point? In Judaism, 90% of the people are just the people... And then you have the very little sliver of people that are pre Levites and priests. You were already promoted as priests. Why do you want to be demoted to the people? What's the point? I don't get it. One new man. Romans 10. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Galatians 3.26-29 For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you're all in one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Ephesians 2, 11 to 18. Therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called circumcision made in the flesh by hand, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, 
strangers from the covenants and promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And for he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained um, in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you, to you who were far off and to those who are near. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. First Peter chapter 2 you, you are chosen generation, royal priest, priesthood, holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out from darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Thank you, Lord. The nation... Now comes the part where you can take the boxes of tomatoes out and get ready. The nation of Israel does have an expiration date. When? Remember I quoted Jeremiah? Remember? Moon, stars, remember? Let's read it again. Thus says the Lord... Who give the sun for a light by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, say that now, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. So what did he say here? As long as you wake up in the morning and the sun is outside, the moon is there, the stars are there, Israel cannot be replaced and Israel cannot be forgotten and cannot be destroyed. However, he says, if those ordinances I just mentioned will no longer be there, then Israel will no longer be a separated nation. When will that happen? <laughs> you see, there is an expiration date. And when will that happen? When God will make new heavens, new earth that contains those whose name are written in the book of life. And there will be in them. Look, I'm reading to you. The Bible talks about the final judgment before the new Jerusalem in Daniel chapter 12. Look what he says. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Isn't that amazing? The angel is telling Daniel that there is going to be a terrible disaster coming upon the nation of Israel. And he says, at that time, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. Holocaust, piece of cake. Something much bigger is going to happen to Israel. But look what he says. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written where? In the book. Which book? Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15. I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were open and another book was open. Single case, plural case. Those books tell you all that you did in your life, that books tell you that you placed your faith in the one who did everything for you. And look what he says. Wait, waste of time. Look what he says. He says this. He says, 
standing in that book was open and another book was open which is the book of life and the dead were judged according to their works works that were described in these books remember by the things which were written in the books remember and the sea gave up dead who were in it then death and hades delivered up the dead who were in them and they were judged each one according to his works that were where described where in the books Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Basically, at the very end, seconds before he will make new heavens, new earth, the new Jerusalem, the greatest separation of all will happen. And the criteria is not whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. It's whether your name is what? Written in the Lamb's book of life or not. And the new Jerusalem, and now comes the punchline. You see, I, I'm pro I promise you, Jeremiah 31 has a point. Then God said in Genesis 1, remember, let there be light and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day darkness he called night so then evening and morning there was the first day and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden so we see two things one God created those elements to bring light two God had fellowship with Adam and Eve without a temple. There was no temple in the Garden of Eden. There was no need for sacrifice, no need for anything. Look, Revelation 21. Then I saw new heavens, new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, if you love sea, surfing, sorry. <laughs> and then look, John, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell in them, uh, with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and they be, th and be their God, and God will wipe away. You see, fellowship again of God with his people, but I saw no temple in it. New Jerusalem, no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city, now watch this. The city had no need of what? The sun or the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its, in the Hebrew, its menorah. The Hebrew, New Testament. Oh. I'm going to change my Bible right now. Now watch this. Two things we see. God in the new heavens and new earth will need no sun, no moon, and no stars. And God will also need no temple. There's no more Jewish advantage. <laughs> There's no more. To them was given the law. To them was this. And... We come to the point where there's no more sun, moon, or stars. So, Israel is no longer a separated nation from before him. Because the new Jerusalem is all about those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Israel ceases to exist in the new Jerusalem. Not that God hate them, destroy them. No, The new Jerusalem is not about Israel and the Gentiles. The new Jerusalem is all about those whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life. God chose Israel following his reboot of the world after the flood. There will no longer be a need for this flagship nation once sin has been removed from the picture and we've received our glorified bodies and eternal home. Take a look at this chart right now. Now, it's a, if you can dim the light, you can clearly see there are actually even different colors. Creation to Abraham, no Israel. Abraham to Jesus, predominantly Israel. 
Jesus to the end of the millennial kingdom, Israel and the church. We exist together. We coexist now. And then in eternity, only those whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life. In the New Jerusalem, it's no longer about Jew or Gentile, but only those recorded in that book. And there will be no Behold Israel anymore. The only, the only remnant from this ministry will be that our members will be citizens of the New Jerusalem. But I will not need to teach you about Israel anymore. I have expiration date for the ministry also. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to spend eternity in the presence of the Lord, whether Jew or Gentile, make sure your name is in the Lamb's book of life. And I want to conclude, because I'm telling you, this is very serious. The world and the enemy will give you false hopes. False battles to fight. False dreams. False. Um, I mean, it's all deception that we see all around us. If you are not this morning, if you sit here if, and you don't know whether you are saved and you don't know whether you will have eternal life and you're not sure if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, this morning, today, is the day of salvation. Amen. I want to tell you something, folks. We will close our eyes now. And I'm going to ask Pastor Steve to come. But this whole message means nothing. If you leave this place without the knowledge that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. We've heard it. Everything will pass away. Everything will change. The one thing that will remain, the one thing that will stay for eternity is if your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I always tell people, eternal life is for everyone. But the question is, location, location, location. Where will you spend your eternity? In communion and fellowship with God or in death which is separation from him forever and ever.